Celebrating 46 years on the air, Award-Winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, we continue our series on farm stress with the emotional story of Stephen Sanford. In Southern Gardening, they may be hardy, but there's no mystery about their beauty. In our feature story, the Endangered Species Act, a howling success, may be too much so. And back on our series, Stephen Sanford survived this wreck, but his recovery was gut-wrenching. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell. Great to have you with us again here on Farm Week. Happy Thanksgiving. This week, an extended story, the fourth installment of our Emmy-winning series on the farm. Today, the heartrending story of Mississippi farmer Stephen Sanford, who faced extraordinary hardship completely out of his control. The story made possible by MSU Films and producer James Parker. about about 2,500 acres. Me and my dad and my brother. Be about 1,800 acres of soybeans, 300 acres of peanuts, and 400 acres of corn, and, and a little bit of sorghum. Milo, we grow a couple of hundred acres of it a year. And we run, run, run about 3,000 head of uh, of uh, winter calves, winter feeder cattle. Yes, sir. Got it there now. When did you get into farming? Did you always know this? Well, I was just just raised up in it. My dad carried me with him when I was little, you know, and and just I just got started started like that. I reckon probably about 1979 or something. I was nine years old. And I'd ride with him on a tractor, and I reckon I was probably about 11 or 12, I started driving, you know, doing around distance and doing farm, and uh, it just, was just kind of in your blood, you know. There was never any doubt you'd be a farmer? Never really any doubt, you know. Never was. What, what are some stresses that farmers face? Well, just weather. Weather, I guess, and money some money you know trying to trying to make it I'd say from the early 80s to the to the mid 90s it was it was you know it was just it wasn't it wasn't no money in it we was just doing it just doing it because we like doing it is the only reason we kept doing it you know it wasn't to make money <laughs> it definitely wasn't to make no profit and help nowadays finding help if you work, that's a pretty good stressor because you can't much find nobody that wants to, you know, that, that, that'll work. So it's about 15 to 20 percent farming on our end and the rest of it's mechanic in and I mean just, just preparing, getting stuff ready to farm, you know, that's what a lot of people want a job. They think that's all we do is just go out there and drive a tractor, you know, but it's a, 
you work all you work on that stuff all year to get to drive it for two months out of the year. I mean, you 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 getting it, keeping it maintained and all. You know, it's a lot more to it than just people pass by and just think you out there driving a tractor. Would you call that a, a farm stress? <laughs> yeah, it is, but it's just really a necessity. I mean, you just got to. Try to keep it good while things is good because you don't ever know what you're going to have to go through or how long it's going to be, you know. Tell me about the wreck. Well, the wreck, we was in May, we do, we ship a lot, you know, all them yearlings. The cattle I was telling you about, we run in the winter. My brother also runs probably 2,000 head of his own, you know, so that puts us about 5,000 to ship in May. So that's pretty much what we do every morning during, the, during May. We started at Bellevue that morning and loaded, I think, five or six loads and uh, of cattle. We got through with that and was moving the corral and all the stuff to another location to load the next morning and we was, got to uh, Summerall and hit 42 West and was headed headed down through there just like any normal day and uh and in a minute I heard tires squealing and, and seen a step side pickup coming at me and that and he hit us I mean just pretty much a head-on accident I remember I, I turned it, you know, to the right to keep from just getting a dead head-on impact, and I think he hit me in the front left-hand wheel right about the tire. And it, it threw us off in the ditch and stayed pinned in, it, pinned in there for I, pretty close to an hour, I think. So, Stephen survived the accident, but was unprepared for what was to come in the months ahead. We'll have the conclusion of Stephen's story later in the show. On the lighter side, they may be hardy, but there's no mystery about their beauty. This week in our Southern Gardening segment, Eddie Smith showcases the ever-popular hibiscus. Only this time, there's a twist. Here's Eddie. Perennial hardy hibiscus is one of those must-have plants that we can count on to brighten up our gardens and landscapes. Today we're in Crystal Springs, Mississippi looking at some gorgeous hardy hibiscus plants. Hardy hibiscus are very different from tropical hibiscus. These plants are winter hardy, having been bred from the native hibiscus found in the swamps and ditches of the south. Also, hardy hibiscus does not offer the shiny, glossy leaves of tropical hibiscus, but a trait the two varieties certainly share are the bright, beautiful flowers. In fact, they're often called dinner plate hibiscus because of their bloom size. Just look at this deep red flower of the summerific Valentine's Crush hibiscus. The large, sheer petals draw your attention inward to the delicate pistil and stamen structure. Head over heels adorn hibiscus features pretty pink flowers with red eyes contrasted next to the low burgundy foliage. Summerific French vanilla flowers emerge a creamy custard yellow with prominent red eyes and mature to white. The blooms of Summerific Spinderella are large, 8-inch white flowers with pink accented edges and a dark red eye. Its dark green leaves form a tidy, dense, well-rounded growth habit. Another hardy hibiscus is the Marshmallow Moon. This plant has 6-inch wide pure white flowers with dark green foliage. So, if you want to add some big, bold flower color to your landscape, take a look at some of the different varieties of hardy hibiscus. I'm Eddie Smith, and I will see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up, the conclusion of our emotional story of Mississippi farmer Stephen Sanford. 
Farming's hard enough, he says, with weather prices and any number of other factors thrown in. But in his case, a car accident added not only immeasurable physical pain, but monumental stress as well. His recovery, as you'll see, was gut-wrenching. The conclusion of our extended story on the farm, coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith, and their right to make their own plans and arrive at their own decisions, and their ability and power to enlarge their lives and plan for the happiness of those they love. I believe that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination, and leadership that these are the keys to democracy, and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest, but also in the interest of society. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations, and their faith. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance toward the views of others. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home, that my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Near the beginning of my career, I reported on a project in Colorado called Mission Wolf, working to reintroduce wolves to the wild. So I'm particularly interested in this next story. Wolves came close to extinction years ago, but it's a different story now, and one with people on both sides of how to manage the species, including ranchers who want to protect their farm animals. Colleen Bradford Krantz has more. Once upon a time, there were two groups of predators who constantly fought over the same prey. They battled one another for generations until, finally, one pushed the other out. Over time, the winning predators began to miss their enemy. Some helped their former rivals return to the once contested forest and fields. And now, it only remains to be seen if they can live side by side. While it may not read like an old storybook, Michigan wildlife biologist Brian Roll keeps a list on his computer of important wolf dates. We actually, throughout the early um, 1900s, you know, killed every wolf you see. They were a bounty animal. You know, all the way up to 1956, we felt there was probably fewer than 100 wolves in the Upper Peninsula. And just four years later, the whole um, bounty was actually removed from the state of Michigan. By the end of the 1960s, gray wolves had all but disappeared from the region, with one small pocket remaining in northeast Minnesota's Iron Range. In 1966, wolves were listed under the precursor to the Endangered Species Act. As things changed, um, both ecologically and socially, People started to realize that predators were a large and a, an important part of an ecosystem. By the 1980s, wolf populations began to rebound across Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Roll says exceeding planned population goals should have resulted in wolves being removed from the endangered species list. Instead, a series of administrative changes in answering lawsuits have meant the wolf status on the list in Michigan has whipsawed changing seven times in an 11-year period. So it's been this yo-yo movement that I don't think has helped wolves. All it does is build this animosity that we can't do anything, we can't protect our own livestock, 
We can't protect our pets. Roll says when those lawsuits succeed, the rare wolf found hunting lambs or calves can only be dealt with through non-lethal means. Nearly all of those measures eventually stop being effective. If we could empower the farmer to do some of those, some of that work, it grants wolves, you know, some some approval rating that we I can deal with that. But when they're this hands off that even though they're killing cattle, I'm not allowed to kill that wolf. That creates the animosity. And then and what, the, what they do is they tell their neighbor, their neighbor tells their buddy, and then it just snowballs. And so people have this belief that, you know, wolves are rampantly killing livestock, which isn't the case. 250 miles away in Minnesota, wolf numbers are climbing and territory is expanding. The state estimates the wolf population now numbers more than 2,800, about two-thirds of the total in the western Great Lakes region. One research team is getting up close and personal in Voyagers National Park near International Falls, Minnesota. Their trail camera footage has helped draw attention to the wolves' gradual return. Unlike in Michigan and Wisconsin, wolves in Minnesota are listed as threatened rather than endangered. This allows government officials to use the last resort option of killing a wolf known to be causing repeated problems with livestock. When wolves are causing problems by eating sheep or eating cattle or hunting dogs or pets, um, which they've been documented to do, no one wins, right? Uh, it's a problem for, for the owners of those animals. It can be an economic problem. Wolves don't win because often USDA Wildlife Services will come in and trap, lethally remove wolves as well to mitigate that conflict. So I, I think everyone has a shared interest to, to minimize that. Wildlife experts have a range of non-lethal options, including guard animals such as dogs, donkeys, and llamas. If those fail, streamers, lights, and alarms could be used to frighten wolves. But none of these work every time you have folks who, who raise livestock who think the only wolf, good wolf is a dead wolf, and you have folks who absolutely enjoy and are thrilled by wolves on the landscape where they're operating. Cattle producer Keith Carlson is learning to coexist with the wolves, which have returned to his sandstone Minnesota farm about an hour south of Duluth. As a, a youngster growing up, well, if we ever heard of or seen a wolf, it was very, very rare. It's probably in the past 20 years or less that uh, we've started to have to deal with wolves that are uh, in this area. There, there's many producers or ranchers throughout this area that have had wolf problems the past. Within the past 10 years, it seems to have gotten even worse. Carlson says the challenges are offset a bit by government reimbursement for livestock killed by wolves. However, the evidence must be clear that a wolf was responsible. Last summer on, on our ranch, we had five confirmed wolf kills, and I'm saying we had eight, but we couldn't prove the other three. But we do have agencies that work well with us help verify that it was a wolf kill. Carlson says Midwest residents are being misled when a population goal is met, but doesn't result in delisting. They all came to an agreement, which that's kind of what's frustrating for us. It, to me, it opens up attacking the whole Endangered Species Act. And I, I certainly don't want to see major changes made to the Endangered Species Act because of one species. When you, when you look at wolves in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan, we, it should be a celebration of the Endangered Species Act. Not used as a tool to keep them perpetually on the list. Back to our series on the farm. Mississippi farmer Stephen Sanford, barely making a profit, hit by an oncoming driver head on. He survived the wreck, but faced incredible stress trying to recover. Here now, the conclusion. We pick up the story with Stephen in the hospital, two broken legs and a cracked vertebrae. I had a Broke my left leg above the knee and right leg below the knee and uh, cracked the L4, I think, vertebrae in my back. 
next thing I know, I woke up, you know, and and it was, um, it was, I'd had surgery. It was about 11.30 at night then. Yeah. And they'd fix my legs back. The research shows that while there are some stressors that all families face, whether they're farm families or not, um, farm families do have some unique ordinary stressors as well as extraordinary stressors that they face. And those extraordinary ones are the ones that the farmers themselves and the farm families themselves really don't have control of. Um, and research shows those are particularly difficult. How did it affect the farm? Yeah, it was right in the middle of you know, we'd had a lot of rain and it throwed us behind and we was trying to plant peanuts and needing to plant soybeans and it just, like I say, it just was, it was a bad, it was the worst time it could possibly happen, which any time's a bad time, but it, it, it really was. A, it put everybody in a bind. <laughs> you didn't see how you was ever going to get over this. You just, you know, you think it's just, think you're going to be like this forever. You, you just like having your hands tied, and you can't do nothing. You know, it just, it just, uh, it hurt. It, it, it messes with you mentally. You know, because you know you need to be doing stuff, and you need to be active, and there ain't nothing you can do. You sitting in there looking out the window and hearing tractors crank up. Well, I wonder where they going now. You roll to the front door of the wheelchair. And, Try to look and call somebody and see where they're going. Just don't. It, it just was just depressing. The success of a family is central to the um, success of a small farm. When we're talking about family farms, um, because it's it's all about that family unit working together and and collaborating to really pull this off. When family members can can pick up and contribute to, um, you know, a, a farm situation, that is going to help mitigate that stress because that that farmer doesn't have to worry about oh I'm I'm losing lo losing that crop, losing that time to harvest. This is the, the perfect time to do it, and now I'm unable not you know unable to do so. Well, I had to, he had that daddy hired. There was some more a guy. Helps another farmer over here, they got caught up, and he come helped us, and just everybody pitching in, you know, just doing the stuff me and Brian were doing, had been doing, you know, and it, it just it just doubled the workload or, or more on everybody, you know. We got everything, everything, but I think about 150 acres of what we set out to plant, planted. They got, got it all, everything done that could be done. It means a lot to have people, have somebody to do it. I don't know what nobody would do if it was just, if you just was farming on your own and wasn't nobody, you know, you didn't have no family. I don't know what nobody would do if they went through that. You'd just probably be out of business is what you'd be. Because cause they ain't, you just, you can't hire people to do stuff like that, you know, to do it like you need it done. I was just focused on trying to get better and whatever the, like the therapist wanted to do, yeah, I want to do it and I want to do more than what he tells me to do because I want to get better quicker, you know, and I just, I believe that's what helped me through it all. My ultimate goal, that's what I told him, I wanted to be able to try to get on the combine and maybe pick a little bit of corn, you know, in the first of September and we met the goal. What kind of feeling does it give you to know where you were, the lowest point, and to now be back to? It feels good. It feels real good. You feel like you feel like you're doing what you you know doing what you're supposed to be. Feel like you're taking up your part of the slack now. You know, you know your part of the job. Now I'm back contributing. You know, it, it's you're back doing what you need to be doing. And you know what you can do. I ain't, I ain't no 100%. I ain't, I ain't a third of what I'm 
going to be here in a few months, but I, or was before the wreck, but um, you got to start somewhere. An incredible story. Very important. If you or someone you know is in emotional crisis, call or text 988 anytime for free crisis support. Well, next time on Farm Week, ag drones coming to the rescue. It's a newish technology building on an old one using drones to fight pests in the fields by delivering sterile insects to mate with them. It's a new spin on something called SIT. We'll meet the owners of a company who helped pioneer this biocontrol technique. We even designed their own drones just to make it work. That story launches next time on Farm Week. Well, we want to take a moment to wish all of you watching this holiday weekend a very happy Thanksgiving. We truly hope that you actually do have so much to be thankful for. I know I do. And I do as well. It's an honor to bring Farm Week to you each week. We hope that this holiday season will be especially bright for every one of you. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and YouTube. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.